All right. So again, thanks everyone for, for coming today and for joining us. We know it's not easy to, uh, in today's day and age to carve out some free time for yourself and, 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 and spend the time to learn. Um, so we really appreciate you, you doing that. Um, my name is Avi Stamen and I am the CEO of Academic Language Experts. Um, this is the third installment of our publication success interview series. Uh, whereby each month I speak with an innovative thought leader in the field of academic publishing about how they are influencing research. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Chris Harrison. Um, Chris is the publication, Publishing Development Director of Humanities and Social Sciences at Cambridge University Press. Um, I'm very honored that Chris has taken the time to speak with me today, and I want to thank him uh, specifically for his cooperation throughout the process leading up to the event. Um, it's been a real pleasure uh, working with him and his colleagues to, to make this happen. Um, we are checking in today. We had a registration of over 2,300 uh, participants, uh, which is really quite incredible and wild. Um, and we already have over 300 people have joined the meeting. Uh, and to me, that's just a testament to, the, to, to how you know, important this topic is uh, for academics, for scholars. Uh, the fact that Chris has taken sort of an out-of-the-box approach to thinking about academic publication um, and not just kind of going with what is, but thinking about what could be. Um, and what's really of interest to the academic community. And I really think that's the reason that there's such broad interest in today's, in today's session. Um, I urge you not to be shy. Use the, uh, use the Zoom uh, chat feature in order to ask your questions. Um, you are, we really would love to hear from you and, and, and know what you're thinking uh, throughout. Um, I apologize, it's very possible that we won't get to every single question today, just do simply to the, the size of our crowd. Um, but if you do have a question, um, share it on the chat and we'll try to get to it as best as we can. And if not, you know, uh, uh, we can be available afterwards um, to answer any, any additional questions. Um, if you have a specific question for uh, a more personal question that you don't necessarily want to share with the, uh, with the whole group, um, you can reach out to via chat uh, to any of the academic language expert staff members. Um, you'll know that they are who they are because they have ALE uh, written at the end of their name. Uh, and you can either ask any personal questions or set a time to discuss with us uh, in the coming days. Um, the interview will be approximately 45 minutes, um, and then we'll have a 15-minute Q&A at the end um, you know, where, we, where you can ask your questions. Um, I do encourage people to stick around for the Q&A. Sometimes really the best information comes out of that. So, so if you can, uh, stay till the end. Um, the interview is being recorded. So if you do want to watch any parts again, if you have colleagues who weren't able to make it and want to pass it along to them, uh, we'll be sending that out after the event. You don't need to ask. Uh, it'll be in your inboxes, hopefully within the next uh, two to three days. Um, okay, so before we actually get in and, and kick off the event, um, I want to share some of our accomplishments uh, over, the last, uh, over the last 12 months. Uh, it's been a difficult you know, and challenging year for everyone. But we at Academic Language Experts tried to pull together the best we could, and we're really proud that we've helped uh, thousands of scholars uh, to translate, edit, and prepare their research in over 50 languages. Uh, articles we worked on and books that we worked on were published in top, uh, top, with top university publishers, uh, such as Yale University Press, Harvard University Press, and of course, Cambridge University Press. Um, we helped thousands of authors with their books, with their articles, uh, across the full spe spectrum of academia, uh, from history and philosophy to biology and engineering. Uh, it's our mission to help scholars and authors achieve their dreams and achieve their dream publications, excuse me, and be a source of guidance and support throughout their entire journey. Um, so if you, you know, do need any support or help with translation or editing services or other publication support, uh, helping put together a proposal, uh, whether it's for, you know, something that Cambridge is doing or any other publishers, don't hesitate to be in touch. Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce you to Chris. That's why we're all here uh, to meet Chris Harrison. Chris has been at uh, Cambridge University Press for 20 years. Uh, initially, he was an economics editor before taking on uh, some more management responsibilities um, for humanities and social sciences as a whole. Uh, prior to Cambridge, uh, Chris worked as a, a social science textbook editor uh, at, uh, at Pearson. 
uh, where he started his career in African and in the African and Caribbean division of Longman. Uh, he got into publishing by accident, actually, um, when he got a grant for his PhD on African history at SOAS. And when that was running out, uh, he discovered that this was kind of a great way to continue his, continue his intellectual curiosity of being able to work with academics and techs, but also sort of hone his business uh, and, uh, and business skills and be able to combine those two uh, to, help, to help scholars. Uh, he completed his PhD at Longman um, and he was happy to you know, put aside the, uh, his academic pursuits in order to continue to help others. Uh, after he finished his dissertation, he wrote his dissertation on France and Islam in West Africa from 1860 to 1960. Um, and that was actually published by Cambridge University Press, but don't worry, there was no conflict of interest. That was 10 years before he got a job there. So, uh, so Chris, um, I really, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, oh, my That's why you can't see me. All right, there we go. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It's, uh, it's a real honor and pleasure to have you here. Um, and we're looking forward to hearing, you know, having you share your, your thoughts and experiences. Well, thank, thanks very much for inviting me. I think it's a great initiative you set up here and it's, um, um, I hope it's, uh, I'm sure it's going to be kind of an interesting conversation. I hope it's going to be of use to everybody. So um, th thanks very much for setting up. I'm really impressed with what you've been doing. So. Brilliant. So I gave everyone, I gave everyone sort of an overview of a little bit of your background and, and uh, you know, and, and, and history, how you got to this place, but maybe you can just talk for a, a quick minute about what your current, you know, work uh, looks like, you know, you can take us through your day and... Sorry, frozen there. Okay, so I'm um, whilst Avi and freezes. So, I mean, setting aside the sort of slightly kind of Groundhog Day feel that we all have during, during lockdown. I mean, I guess my role, I'm a publishing director for the Humanities and Social Sciences Books Division. Um, most of our editors are based in two locations in Cambridge, where I'm based, and, and in New York. Um, we also have an editor I work closely with in, in Singapore and um, editorial, editorial groups in, um, in Delhi and in, in Melbourne. And I guess a typical day um, was sort of made up of um, sort of task activities from kind of three broad, but very overlapping into interrelated areas of kind of, of management, of sort of the strategizing and sort of more mundane kind of spreadsheets and admin and problem solving. Um, a lot of time is taken up with with people, with colleagues, particularly during lockdown, making sure staying in touch that, you know, people are getting on okay. Um, and then happy to say that we're still able to spend a large part of our time with what I think really excites us all in the publishing industry about being in publishing is, is content, you know, kind of working with people such as everybody on this call with, you know, doing, finding out more about their, um, their research um, and figuring out sort of the best ways of, of publishing that and making it um, as sort of a impactful as possible um, for everybody. So it's an overlapping um, set of activities with a, with a really kind of talented team of, um, of editors um, in North America and in Cambridge, yeah. Great, so okay, on that note, um, in terms of helping scholars, uh, what I'd like to do uh, before we jump into the, to the meat uh, of, the, uh, of the questions, um, I wanna run two quick polls uh, to just get a feel for the room and figure out who it is that is joined us today. Um, I'm going to read the, everyone should have their, uh, the questions uh, showing up on their screen momentarily. Um, and I'm going to read the questions out as well, because uh, for those who will receive the recording later on, they actually can't view the questions. So um, the, the first question is, how many academic peer-reviewed books and articles uh, have you published? Uh, this is over the course of your career. Um, yeah, I'll give everyone a minute to, uh, to answer, and then we will uh, we'll end the polling, and, and everyone should be able to see the results. Okay, so uh, here, let me share the results with everyone. Uh, interesting. So it seems as if we have a nice spread of, uh, of scholars with, uh, with about, yeah, it, it seems like about uh, half are, you know, have only published up to five publications. Um, so maybe they're more junior scholars, at least in terms of their publishing uh, career. And then about half uh, have at least five publications with 11% with having um, 25, uh, over 25 publications. So it seems like we're going to have to uh, give our answers here today and, and have our discussion in a way that's, uh, you know, as relevant to the broad spectrum uh, uh, that's being represented today as possible. Um, that's great. Okay. Um, I'm going to run one more poll now and then maybe we'll do one a bit later. 
Okay, so this is actually a question that relates to language. Um, uh, I'm curious out of the scholars who are joining us today, uh, how many write in uh, their mother tongue and translate to English? How many uh, write in English, uh, maybe that's not their mother tongue and, and send to an English language editor? And then how many uh, write and submit without needing any language editing services uh, whatsoever, maybe because it's their mother tongue or they have, uh, they feel that, that, that it's not necessary. Okay, great. Uh, and sharing the results, um, interesting. So here it seems like the majority, about two thirds uh, don't need any help um, with uh, language editing. 27% uh, do write in English and then get it edited and then another 6% um, write in their native tongue and, and, and translate. Okay, fantastic, um, that's great. Um, great, okay. So that gives us a little bit of an impression of, of who's joining us today. Um, and with that, I think we can, we can jump in. So, okay, can you tell us, um, just to start us off, Chris, um, what are, in your mind, what are the traditional publishing models um, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about how they came to be, become those traditional publishing models. And uh, why do you think they have such a strong hold on academia? And to make it very as practical as possible, when I talk about traditional publishing models, um, you know, the, the normal sort of ordinary um, uh, uh, four that we're familiar with. So books, uh, articles, um, you know, as the way that we publish the research in the way that we do. Sure, thanks, yeah. So. Um... I mean, it's a pretty easy question to answer. What, what are the traditional publishing models? I think we're all incredibly familiar with the world of books and, and journals. I mean, since the, um, the first uh, scientific journal was published in the late 17th century, um, the academic world has been one of books and journals and um, um, they have really kind of stood, stood the, the test of um, time because they do a really good job. They do things really well. So I think in, in journals, um, have proven to be incredibly effective and successful way of which scholars can um, can share um, discrete um, pieces of research, test out a discrete argument, um, going through a quality assurance um, process, the peer review process, which um, um, by and large people um, still um, has, has earned a lot of kind of trust and um, people respect. Um, but so once an article has been accepted, it gets published relatively quickly. It's out in the academic world. It's part of the academic record and part of debate. So, I mean, so, so journals have, have been really effective at that. And um, I think kind of books um, have also st um, been popular because uh, they allow space for, for scholars um, to kind of a mature reflection to present not just their own research but to kind of to situate it in a wider literature join the dots make the connections um and um so forth so um and that, anything that i'm going to be saying this afternoon is um in no way kind of uh, critical of the world of books and journals at cambridge university press we absolutely love books and journals we publish 1500 books a year we've got 400 or, or journals um and you know i think in the academic world um wouldn't be where it is without um without without books and journals so um but i would say on that their kind of longevity is also related to um um something which i think we're kind of less aware of we don't ask ourselves very much but they have actually become institutionalized in the way that we organize knowledge and the way in which um, we recognize academic careers. So the world of, um, you know, kind of publish or perish is very much the world of published journal articles or, or books. And so they have this institutionalized effect as well, which locks us all into it. So if, it, if journals and, and books are a really great way of communicating knowledge, what, what was it that, that irked you or what was it that brought you to say, you know what, there's maybe we're missing something here and there's something else that needs to be done was it something you know that was that that's more technological was it something did you feel like there was a gap in the market like how how did the you know you're thinking about new conceptions for academic fora come about sure so um well i'm um, as you mentioned earlier i mean i used to be a commissioning editor i used to spend a lot of time um with faculty in, in their offices talking about their research um, and I'd so often hit, have the conversation with with um, with professors saying that you know they've got um, some stuff they'd really like to write, but they're a bit frustrated because the um, it was kind of didn't fit that naturally into a into the journal format length. It was maybe a bit too long, or the kind of methodologies and mixed methodologies, case studies, and so forth. Um, um, so that 
they will struggle to, to, to see how they could fit it into a journal. But on the other hand, they didn't want to commit to writing a, a, a full length monograph. And you know, I came back and talked with, with colleagues about that. And we all, we've all had similar experiences. I mean, all my colleagues have had hundreds of conversations with, with academics who've been frustrated about not having a natural outlet for, for stuff which actually would make a lot of sense for them to write. And um, when you think about it, it is a slightly odd choice that we do have this um, choice either to kind of to write it, um, you know, a long journal article will be about 10,000 words, a lot of maximum journal lengths are shorter than 10,000. Typically a monograph would be maybe kind of 70 to 100,000 words. So if you do sort of back of the envelope calculations, you realize that a huge percentage of the peer reviewed research, that's research that's recognized in the community, that's recognized by um, um, tenure committees is either shorter than 10,000 words or longer than 70,000 words. And that's kind of um, a sort of uh, kind of crazily sort of artificial um, choice that people have to make. I mean, it's a bit like in sort of in the car industry, if, if the, the, mo the global motor industry decided that it only wanted to make kind of zippy little sports cars or great big, um, you know, kind of people carrier minivans and there was, they never invented a kind of the mid-sized sort of family car. So, um, so the, 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 um, the impulse for, for what we're doing very much came from all these conversations we've had with academics expressing their frustration about not having an actual outlet to, to write this research. Got it. And then, okay, so then what did you, after you had that sort of, you know, light bulb moment or, or yeah. know, happened over time, yeah. uh, what was the concept that you developed and ended up, you know, or what was the concept that you came up with and ended up trying to develop over time that would address that, that gap? Sure. Yeah, well, I think in, sort of in the old sort of days when the academic world was very much a print world there wasn't very much we could do we could sympathize with and sort of shrug our shoulders but it wasn't a huge amount to do but as you know we've um publishing academic scholarly publication is much more a digital world we realize that those um, distinctions are artificial and that there are the things which we are able to maybe able to, to address so we had sort of amongst colleagues we had a sort of rather thought experiment about you know, if you could combine the best features of books and journals what would it look like and so we sort of spent some time just sort of thinking um, in very abstract terms about, you know, what a, a genuine sort of hybrid combining best of both worlds would look like. And, you know, we thought that from the journals world, what works really well is the kind of the quality assurance, the organizing um, content in series works well, the speedy publication works well. And I think also because journals are big business, we've um, developed all sorts of author services, which um, we don't have so much in, in the books world, which uh, add value to the, the content. Um, and from books, I mean, it's very much the, the space, the length, which I think is, is really good. Um, um, people kind of value. And we also realize that people don't want to make that binary choice between print and, and digital. I mean, actually, they both can coexist. They've got different strengths. Um, and so we thought you know, to do something which combined both print and, and digital would be um, the way forward. So um, that was a our thinking in-house, we talked to librarians, we talked to professors, uh, and um, we came up with the elements concept and um, um, took the plunge. Right, got it. And what's the, so this is the, the element series that you're, that you're discussing now? Sorry, yes, yeah, so um, yeah, I should have, so we, um, we, um, it'd be interesting to see if we could actually kind of describe a format which uh, we didn't want to pigeonhole as either a book or a journal and so we kind of came up with this uh, um, generic title of, of elements um, and Cambridge elements and I think you know we're going to share more details of um, what that looks like um, in one of the the, the screens um, so yeah Cambridge elements was our hybrid books and journals format um, with um, so we tried to combine the, the best of, of books and books and journals so Got it. And what what sort of as you were developing and even now today, you know, as you're trying to get the word out about this new for this new way of publishing or this new opportunity, what are some of the biggest challenges or struggles that you face, you know, in trying to educate an academic public, which let's be honest, isn't necessarily always the most um, adept to, you know, to new things. And also it's not, you know, I, I don't want to put the blame on academics. Sometimes it's the institutions that don't necessarily recognize new uh, publishing fora, what, are, what have been some of the challenges of, you know, as you've been trying to roll this out and, and develop it? Sure, so um, 
uh, well, we had a, a bunch of internal challenges, but I'm not going to bore people with, with those. But externally, I mean, I think the, the first challenge was very much to um, get people to understand what we were talking about, sort of describing something which, which didn't exist. And we concentrated to begin with because we'd taken the decision that we wanted to follow the journal's world of organising the content in, in series that we wanted. Our first um, step was to interest um, potential series editors to start new series. Um, so um, you know, the, the challenge of getting them to sort of grasp what we were talking about, and actually it turned out to be um, surprisingly easy because I think so many people had sort of seen that frustration, had sort of had really kind of had been longing for this sort of mid-form content. So we found it um, really kind of pleased how quickly we were able to, uh, to persuade a, a group of um, kind of very senior professors from top research universities to take the plunge with us. And it was initially a leap of faith that they had to take and we, we had to, part of the, the, the sales pitch was that they were part of a pioneering effort really which we hope could be quite transformative in, um, in the world of academic scholarship. Um, we started off with a kind of proof of concept working in a small number of subject areas, particularly in politics and philosophy, just to sort of to, to road test stuff. But as um, we found the response getting so positive, we rolled it out across the full spectrum of the subject areas that we, we publish in. And so we've now got over 130 series right across the, the spectrum of the arts and sciences, so everything from sort of ancient Egypt to cutting edge electronic engineering. And, and I think that's an indication, actually, of, as you said, the academic world is a, has a fairly conservative in many ways. Um, um, but that is this, I think we could have tapped into a real kind of thirst for um, to, to offer something a bit um, different. So stage one was very much getting the series editors on board and then to persuade people to, to write content. So we're all aware that everybody on this call, you've all got choices, you're busy people. Um, you know, are you going to devote time to writing something that you know is going to has been kind of recognised for three hundred years in a journal article or a book? Or will you take the plunge with us with with elements? Um, and we've been really pleased again about the kind of the, the response that we've had there. So we've got um, four hundred elements published. We've had got another eight hundred under contract, um, and we've got a range of um, uh, um, people at different stages of their career. So we anticipated to begin with, maybe it would be more appealing to um, senior scholars post-tenure, but actually the, the spread of authors we've got is um, right across the, from that kind of early career through to um, established tenured professors from all around the world. So, um, so it turned out to be relatively um, easier than, than I think we'd expected to, to get people on board. And I think, as I say, that was an indication of the, the frustration people have had with, um, with that binary choice of books and journals. Got it. Okay. And so I'm just going to push you a little bit on the, you know, uh, you, even though you're, you're, I understand you're creating something new, um, but in terms of, you know, when I go on the website and I take a look, am I seeing something that would more remind me of a journal? Would it more remind me of a book? What, maybe, maybe you can give us a few examples of, of what you took from books and what you took from journals to give people sort of a better, you know, more concrete uh, idea in their mind of what they'd be reading or looking at when they would see an elements piece or, or if someone would want to write an elements piece. Sure. So um, I say from journals, what we took very much was the organization in, in, in series um, and the brace um, uh, reinforcing the message which we have in books world as well around the quality assurance and, and peer review. We have um, the um, the elements have both an ISSN and an ISBN, so they can um, they, they look both ways. The format, um, if you look at the page format, it resembles a somewhat um, uh, a journal. It has, has abstract keywords, corresponding author. But then, when you kind of read and you kind of see the the the, the way in which authors have the, the space to write, so we have a, a word count of twenty to thirty thousand words. So it's you know, kind of significantly longer than a journal article, but Equally, it's distinctively shorter than, than a book. It does give people the, the, the space to, um, you know, to develop arguments and um, situate their, their work in, in that wider literature as, from, as in the books world. But, um, but there are more focused topics and um, there is a word limit. So it's um, um, uh, maybe just that more concise treatment than you would find in, in books. So, um, so we, at the moment, we're still very much in the stage of not wanting to be say that we either are a book or, or a journal. We're saying no, no, <laughs> we're a mid-form element, but um, but 
clearly there is, as you, you're saying, we can, there are aspects of it which are very familiar to people from the journal's world and aspects which are very familiar from the, from the book's world. Got it. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I see there's a lot of questions flying in. I see that some of them are, um, some of them we're going to address uh, in the continuation, like uh, they're on my sheet. So you've, you've, you, uh, I'm glad that we're asking the same question. Uh, and some of them uh, are new and I haven't thought of. So, you know, we're not ignoring, uh, but we'll, we'll try and organize them uh, uh, towards the end. If we don't cover your topic, please do remind us. Um, the, okay, so two, two questions I'm going to ask you together. First of all, what's the submissions process like? Is it more similar to a book that I'm putting together a proposal and a prospectus? Or is it more similar to a journal article, just in terms of what I actually need to have ready and prepare in order to do this, the technical submission? Um, and then is there an open access? Uh, um, how, does, how, does the, how does the elements in open access work or not work together? Sure. Okay, well, this um, submission process, again, as the theme of the, the hybrid nature, I mean, the parts of um, um, it's neither a book submission process nor a journal submission process. So the way it works is that um, series editors um, will invite or receive unsolicited um, proposals. We'd expect at the first stage just to see a short two or three page prospectus and we've got the templates and guidelines about sort of what kind of information we'd want. When a series editor is, is happy with that prospectus and there's quite a high level of sort of choice and selection at that stage, um, they sh share that with Cambridge editor just to um, the, check that everybody's on, on board and then at that stage we will issue a, a contract um, but the publication itself will be conditional on the, um, the full manuscript going through a uh, peer review process so once the contract is, is issued we set the author up in an online submission system as in the journals world we use Scholar One so um, Scholar One's expecting the submission and so the, the submission and the review process all takes place within, within Scholar One and um, at the moment, virtually all elements going through, once, they, once they've been accepted at the early kind of uh, prospective stage, we're not expecting to see many um, rejections. So the, the review process is, is, is rigorous and almost all of them go through revise and resubmit. Um, but we don't have as many um, rejections at that stage as you would have in, in a journal process. So in that sense, it's closer to the, to the books world. But yeah, everything goes is via the series editors rather than via the in-house Cambridge editor, um, unlike in the books. So as to open access, yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, very much um, we have uh, um, gold open access rates, which we advertise, and um, I forget how many um, gold open access elements we've published already, but it's a growing number, as, as you can imagine. Um, but in addition to that, I'd sort of highlight that we have a very permissive green open access policy so that you know, there's no kind of embargoes on time for um, uh, posting um, submitted manuscripts and so forth. And then I think kind of uniquely, and it's not strictly open access, and I have to be a bit careful about how we describe that, but one of the things that we really wanted to, um, to ensure was accessibility of content. Um, so we make all elements content um, completely free to access for two weeks when it's after its first um, publication online. So for two weeks, authors, uh, uh, we encourage authors to you know, spread the word about their work being available free to access. And um, um, that's been incredibly popular and we're seeing some you know, kind of astonishingly high usage rates when we um so but yeah open access clearly it's part of our world and um uh so we have this both gold and gold and green and then in the spirit of open we have the the free access for two weeks after publication got it um i see here there's a question uh from uh mirth i hope i'm pronouncing your name right um about how how special how specialized are the or how niche are the articles uh, or the pieces that are in the element series? Meaning, are are you tr are you looking for more uh, broad overviews of a subject matter? Is it okay to get into the weeds with specific questions or specific uh, topics? Um, and then I want to combine that question with, I guess, a related question, which is that I know that when I was, uh, you know, back, back before COVID, when I, I spent a lot of time uh, going from university to university speaking with scholars, one of the most common frustrations that I, uh, I came across were uh, scholars who were working on interdisciplinary research and research that uh, struck different fields, which seemed to be, uh, you know, which seemed to be different, uh, you know, 
had a, a particular challenge in publishing the research because it didn't fit exactly into the aims and scopes of any one particular journal. Um, so is there is that something that the Elements series, you know, uh, would encourage interdisciplinary pieces, or is it really better to focus on one specific uh, area of it, uh, one specific field? Sure, thanks. So I'll take the um, the question from one of the participants first about how, how specialized. So we um, don't want the um, extra word count that's uh, available in Elements to be um, just to pad out a, a journal article. So um, um, don't want to make them kind of long specialized journal articles, but we want to use that space to allow scholars to um, present their own original research, but to situate it, as I say, in, um, in a wider context of literature to, to have, have a survey. So the um, series vary a little bit, the extent to which some um, are focus more on the original research and some which are more surveys, but we the, the brief we give to series editors is to try and find a sweet spot which is appropriate for their discipline between um, uh, purely the original research of the, the author um, and uh, reporting on the sort of what you know, a highly kind of personalized view that the author has on what's most important in the literature. Um, this is why I think it's important um, and this is how my work relates to it. So. Um, some elements are more specialised than others, but um, I think we always want to make sure that uh, even specialised ones, so that uh, care is taken to, to situate it in that wider context so that readers have a better understanding of its significance. And as to the disciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary question, I mean, when we were doing the early kind of scoping, I think one of the things which we found in one of the areas that re uh, which were the elements concept seemed to resonate particularly well was in interdisciplinary areas where I think again, it is that much more difficult for people to find the appropriate outlets for their work in the existing um, journals and, and book series. So we have set up an, a number of series which are explicitly interdisciplinary. Um, and um, I think uh, I expect to, to see more of those. We also um, worth saying that um, all elements content is available on our platform alongside our books and journals content. And we kind of put, put related, um, related content suggestions next to it. Um, so we're able to kind of to uh, highlight um, um, you know, kind of relatedness issues and things with um, there. So it's, um, I think it's something which um, is appealing to interdisciplinary scholars. We have got some interdisciplinary series um, and so we're, we're trying to emphasize the, the linkages between uh, content across books, journals, and, and elements. So. Got it. Okay. And, and to wrap up this part of the conversation, um, can you, you mentioned before uh, that you had that the usage numbers, um, and I guess by that you mean you know views and downloads of, mm -hmm. of these materials are, are quite high, maybe higher rel higher than other you know similar or or you know journals um, that may be discussing some of these issues. And I'm curious. Um, you know, if you think that is a, something that scholars should take into account, meaning what happens post-publication, um, how many people are reading what it is, how many downloads, is that, are those sort of vain metrics that, you know, scholars can't really control anyway, so it's not something they should worry about, or is it something that should be taken into consideration when considering where it might be worthwhile to publish their research? Yeah, I mean, I think it's incredibly important, and, um, and it's very much, I think the metrics that people are looking at more and more around kind of usage and, and in, impact. Um, everybody, you know, wants their work to be kind of to be read and discussed and debated and cited. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think kind of usage is, is really important. And again, as we move into a digital world, um, you know, we, we emphasize and talk a lot more about usage as, as much as about sales and, and physical sales is one thing, but it doesn't, if a, if a library acquires a uh, um, a digital version of a book or an element or whatever. Um, that's that's one sale, but it may be you know kind of um, five hundred people kind of reading it. So, um, so yeah, usage I think is something to be important um, is important, um, and we kind of try and provide tools. And I think the publishing industry generally is getting much better at um, providing um, easy uh, ways of. Seeing metrics, so we show kind of usage for, for downloads and views, um, and alt metrics, for way, how many times um, content is talked about in social and mainstream media, and those sorts of things. So I think it is important, and nobody wants to write stuff which just gets locked away in a silo and nobody has access to it. So, got it. Okay, so I wanna I wanna um, 
move ahead to, and I want to try something here. Uh, and we'll, I haven't done this before, so hope, we'll see how it works. Um, but I want to give you a series of rapid fire questions um, because I, I don't want this to, I want people to, to and so we have a lot of questions here about how it works. Um, and so I'm going to limit you to two sentence answers. Um, I won't cut you off, but, uh, but try to keep it as, as short and succinct as possible so we can cover some of these questions that I think are really relevant, you know, the nuts and bolts of sort of how it works. And then um, I encourage people to stick around because afterwards we're going to be discussing, um, we'll be discussing just publishing books and, and journals, uh, journal articles with Cambridge in general. So if the element series maybe is less relevant to you at this current time for whatever reason, um, you know, you'll also get some great information about that. Okay, so uh, let's get straight to it. Um, is it only a uh, digital format or uh, is there a hard uh, copy as well? Sure, every, all elements are published um, in both digital and print. So the print is an inexpensive print-on-demand paperback. Um, the digital is either for, for libraries or you can also available on Kindle and other, other reader platforms, yeah. Got it. Um, what are the areas, of, what are the main areas of interest or the, main, the most developed uh, uh, fields that, that you're most uh, widespread in? Sure. So, um, so we've extended the elements form, format across all the areas that we publish in. So we do cover the full spectrum of the arts and sciences, but um, we have particular concentrations in, um, um, in, in some areas. So philosophy, political science, um, linguistics, um, increasingly in, in history, um, also in music, literature. Um, so a really kind of broad, broad spectrum and we're adding new series all the time. Got it. Okay. Um, if, if, are, are they, is my piece, if let's say I publish an elements, is my piece published as an independent piece or is it part of like a bigger series or, or a volume? Sure. So it's, um, it's a self-standing um, piece, um, um, but it's published very much within, within a series. So we can't publish an element unless it's with, within a series, but it's, it's, uh, it's self-standing. Got it. Uh, what's the average length of, a, of an elements piece? Yeah, so twenty to thirty thousand words is the uh, our target word length. We're trying we police that pretty strictly because I say we don't want to kind of to morph to slip into the world of slightly long articles or just short books. So we thought that's a good length, which um, as I say, kind of gives people more space than they would have in a journal, but doesn't mean that it gets uh, becomes basically just a, a short monograph. Okay, how do I make contact? Let's say it's something that interests me. Who do, who should I be in touch with, or is there a form online? How do I yeah, so we have for each element series um, has a, a landing page, has a web page on, on the website, and they have contact details for the, um, the series editors. So the submission process, as we were saying earlier, is, is closer to the journals world. So it's via the, via the uh, academic series editors rather than the in-house Cambridge people. Got it. Um, what happens, what's the, what does the review process look like? What happens after I submit? Is it more similar sure. to a book? Is it more similar? I think you touched on this a little bit, but. Yeah, yeah so as I said, there's an initial um, um, review by the series editor and the editorial board, whatever, um, of the prospectus and a contract is offered at that stage, but then the review process then is of the full completed submitted manuscript. Um, and that's um, a single blind, uh, refereeing um, and it's pretty kind of rigorous and um, uh, as I said, the environment of, of scholar one uh, with uh, the outcome most common outcome for us is revise and resubmit so got it okay um, and I see this question has been raised a lot so it's obviously important um, uh, and I bet you're I bet you can even guess what I'm going to be getting at but uh, how 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 do I put it on my CV? You know, are, wait, when I go for my tenure committee, are they going to be like elements? What the hell is this? Um, yeah. But, yeah. So as I say, for all that um, we're wanting to resist that kind of binary um, choice, we know that in the real world, people have to make that choice. And so the suggested citation and the way in which I think people uh, put it on their CVs is as a book. Um, but the, um, as I say, the, Anecdotal evidence we've had so far is that tenure committees are impressed by it and recognize it and um, and so forth. So, but yeah. Got it. Okay. All right. I, I, I do want to, I want to spend uh, a few minutes uh, just discussing general tips for publishing with, with Cambridge, because I think that's important, both the element series as well as to books and journals. Um, and then at the end, hopefully we'll be able to cover some of the questions that, that we weren't able to uh, just yet. Um, okay. Um, 
we, we had previously done, in a previous uh, interview we had done, uh, we had discussed uh, we had discussed what goes into a prospectus or a proposal for a book. Um, and one of the things that, one of the common questions that came up from scholars was, how much should my prospectus really focus on, or my proposal really focus on, you know, sort of the, the nitty gritty of my research and what I'm coming to, you know, what new um, innovation or uh, ideas am I bringing to the fore that weren't there prior? Uh, versus how much am I trying to sell my book? How much do I, how much do you care about who the audience is going to be? Uh, you know, who might be interested in it? What, you know, other scholars maybe I'm arguing with or I'm contending with, um, you know, sort of maybe uh, external factors that may impact uh, the importance of publication. Am I, am I writing a marketing document or an academic one? That's, that's sort of the question yeah. again. Yeah, well, kind of the, the, the easy sort of um, try to answer is it's, it's, it's both. Um, I think my, um, strong advice is to don't don't treat us as subject experts in, I mean when I say us the in-house commissioning acquisitions editors um, as subject experts so don't go into too much of the nitty-gritty detail of, of your research um, because we're not really kind of qualified to, to, to judge that but we want to get a sense um, from you uh, of what your um, your kind of originality and significance claims are if we say for our research monographs which is obviously a huge part of our book publishing interested in publishing work that is um, um, uh, not just original but is uh, makes a significant contribution to the literature so um, you know, kind of don't be shy about uh, spelling out the originality claims but to try and do so in, in relatively kind of non non-technical language um, so that we can understand really how your work fits in with the um, with the other published literature both on the Cambridge list and, and, and elsewhere um, in terms of target readership, I think uh, people are often tempted to try and say that their, their work will appeal to a you know, sort of an probably kind of broad section of society. Um, in reality, most academic um, research is aimed at very specific academic communities, and there's nothing wrong with that. And as a university press, that's you now that's our market. That's who we deal with. So don't I? I wouldn't be tempted to try and sort of exact. Um, find lots and lots of potential readers, it's much more useful for us to know specifically which academic community um, are you really kind of targeting this, this, this work at. So um, be pretty specific. So yeah, so it's a mixture say, of um, an academic um, and, a, and a marketing piece. Um, but the evaluation of the academic intellectual content will be done by, by peer review. We, as in-house editors, we need to, just need to understand like kind of where it fits in and sort of the, the significance um, to help us make our initial decisions. Okay. And when I'm considering different publishers, is there a big difference in your mind between academic publishers uh, that are not university publishers and university publishers or different types of, I mean, what would, what would you say makes uh, Cambridge maybe different than some of the other uh, publishers that are out there? Sure. I mean, I think um, one thing to just be aware of is there, there is a huge range of publishers out there, both commercial, academic publishers and university presses. Um, so I'd always really encourage um, people to do a lot of homework first before approaching any anybody to really understand what, what um, their, their choice is, because everybody faces choices. There's a big range of publishers, um, um, kind of large and small. And that's true even within the university press sector. So there's uh, there's a tremendous um, range within within the UP sector. So Cambridge and um, our good friends at Oxford, we're kind of slightly unusual in, in our size. Um, we're publishing you know, across arts and sciences, um, books and journals, um, and at different levels. And we're also slightly in terms of um, we're not subsidized by our parent universities in any way and on the contrary we're expected to um, you know, pay our own way and to generate um, any surplus for, for the university but I think what all the university presses probably kind of share is they all part of their parent universities uh, they, they share that that um, that mission and at Cambridge when, when I joined from you know a really um, uh, sort of world-leading commercial publisher what really struck me about Cambridge was how really how serious the the peer review and quality assurance process was um, 
Uh, that's our kind of brand is, is built on that. Um, so we take it really seriously. And I think so what all the university presses will have in common is that um, the ultimate decision makers aren't the in-house staff, but the, um, the editorial board made up of faculty from their university. So at Cambridge, we have to present every single publishing project to our editorial board. Um, they see all the referee reports. So that keeps us honest and on our toes. And we, um, you know, we don't submit stuff unless we're really certain of the... Um, um, the, the quality and confident of a, of a positive outcome. So, um, yeah, so that I think maybe, you know, we do set the, um, the we take the, that reviewing process pretty seriously, maybe take a little longer, maybe else, elsewhere. But for us, it's, that's really important to our brand. And, you know, I think it, it shows in, we, uh, you know, our book list wins a lot of prizes, um, you know, that's uh, for, for, for our, junior scholars first first books as well as a senior one so um but i think there's a huge range of publishers out there and um wouldn't say any one is sort of better than the others and it's horses for courses to a certain extent and you know my own field african studies and i think that was um there are a couple of very small imprints there who did a fantastic service for the um african studies community I mean, they were kind of the independent commercial publishers but they did a really good job for for that community so Okay, interesting. Um, all right, I want to wrap up this part uh, because we're, we're already running out of time. Uh, but before we do, in, in light of what you were talking about in terms of the, the quality necessary in order to submit to Cambridge, um, to what extent does a proposal, uh, whether for elements or for a book, uh, need to already be in tip top shape in terms of English language and, and polishing up the language? Um, you know, or can at least for the initial uh, submission, can it be, you know, sort of uh, in the author's own language, especially if they're, you know, not uh, mother tongue English speakers, um, and then have it polished up later once once it's been accepted? Yeah, so I think um, I would say that the um, the English has always got to be kind of good enough. We don't expect it to be to be perfect. I think it's important that it's not sort of off-puttingly uh, it's not off-putting and will kind of um, distract um, potential referees from the, you know, the brilliance of the argument. So I think it is worth um, uh, paying quite a lot of attention to it, but we don't expect everything to be in, you know, in perfect, perfect English. It's kind of good enough scientific English and the standards for that will vary obviously from discipline to discipline. So um, in, I think in the humanities subjects, you know, maybe um, Expect maybe sort of slightly higher standards of, of English than in hard social sciences where, where I worked with, with more kind of mathematical content so good enough scientific language is okay. Um, so I think it's always worth getting um, somebody to check over your proposal just to make sure that there's nothing off-putting in there. Um, we do uh, occasionally can review um, typically published books in other languages. And so we've re recently been through an exercise of um, reviewing a Japanese economics book, which I think we're gonna go ahead with. And with the original round of, re of reviewing for that was amongst Japanese speakers. So we do do a certain amount of that, um, not so much from um, original content. So for, 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 for Japanese economists submitted their proposal in Japanese and hadn't previously been published to them um, as a book in Japan, that would be problematic for us. Um, we have a all our book content goes through a copy editing process, so um, but that's not one which will turn bad English into good English. So kind of getting it into a good enough English is an author's responsibility, and I think you know that's where the kind of services which which you provide are, are really invaluable. I think, but we we are we do want as much as possible to make sure that we have a sort of as diverse geographically diverse an author base as possible because. We are very conscious that there's some fantastic research going on um, outside, you know, traditional homelands of North America and Western Europe. So I, mean, I, I myself spent quite a lot of time in, in Asia pre-lockdown doing kind of workshops and so forth. And it's been really invaluable, I think. So. Yeah, that's something that I really want to emphasize because I think that sometimes scholars, for, you know, uh, now from North America or, or mainland Europe um, have the impression that, you know, that, that, that maybe Cambridge is off limits to them. And I, I try and encourage them and say, no, you, you know, you have it, you have it all backwards. Actually, um, that's what they're looking out and searching out. And, and I also, one other thing that I always like to tell, you know, to tell people is that there are, um, their, you know, language skills and writing skills are not the same thing. Um, and there are, we have, we work with many brilliant writers uh, who, for whom English is not their mother tongue. 
Uh, but yet they're wonderful writers and it's just a matter of, you know, fixing up their, their grammar and making sure that it's ready to go. And we work with, uh, you know, we also work with, uh, with, with native English speakers who, you know, have what to learn uh, in terms of, <laughs> of writing. So, you know, th those are two different topics, but they can, but, but either one, you know, a lacking in either one can distract the reviewer from, you know, the, the, the main focal, the main focus of the, of the, of the project. So. Yeah, I think that's a really important message. I heartily um, endorse those. <laughs> that's great. Okay, so what I want to do now is um, I want to uh, quickly give everyone, uh, everyone should be able to see my screen. Uh, Liron, if you could share uh, the services link. So uh, if uh, anyone does want to be in touch, follow-up questions, things that we did not, we're, we're, we're not able to address in the time that's allotted to us, um, if you want to be in touch with me, uh, please do uh, feel free to uh, to shoot me an email. Uh, you can go onto our website uh, to learn more. Um, you'll also see Liron's going to share in the chat now uh, a link to our services page. So if you do want to understand a little bit more about how we, we you know, if you think that we can help you uh, with whether it be translation, editing, uh, consulting, um, you know, academic review before submitting, you know, before you're ready to, to, to send it off to Chris and his colleagues, um, please do reach out and be in touch and, uh, and, and, and speak to us about your project. Um, and then if you wanna know more about the, either just what it means to be an author at Cambridge uh, or the Element series in general, uh, please do uh, visit the Cambridge website and, and where there's really a ton of information. Uh, you can spend a few days there uh, just learning about how, how things work, but, but I, I, will, I will give them credit that it's actually very clear and, and well-organized. And, and sometimes, sometimes when we're helping scholars just to understand what the journal guide is, you know, or the publishers call it, is asking for, can be a, a maze in itself. Um, and I find that the Cambridge website is, is quite clear and, and straightforward. So, so, um, so that's in terms of uh, being in touch with us. Please don't hesitate. Uh, any question, uh, nothing too big or too small. Um, I wanna encourage everyone to check out our upcoming events. Uh, these are the events that will be coming up over the next few months. Uh, in April next month, uh, we're going to be sitting down with actually three, three, uh, it's going to be a panel discussion, should be, should be fascinating, um, with, uh, mainly with Cedric cohen Scali, who's a, a, a scholar uh, from Haifa University, uh, for whom we translated his manuscript uh, and was published by Brandeis University Press. So we're going to be talking with him both about his book, um, as well as how he worked with, uh, with the, the, the publisher, with Brandeis in this case. Uh, in order to prepare it for publication. So that should be really interesting and fascinating. Um, number two, uh, in May, we're going to be talking uh, with, we're going to be talking with Stephanie uh, from Brill, Stephanie Paulvest from Brill, uh, about open access. So that's definitely something uh, that's worth, uh, that's worth checking out. Uh, and then uh, in June, we're going to be sitting down with Marshall Poe, who, uh, if anyone here is, listens to the New Books Network podcast, uh, you'll be familiar with his voice. Um, he is the, the creator and founder of the New Books uh, Network. If you're not familiar, I encourage you to check it out. Um, it's a network of podcasts. And he's going to be talking about, okay, now that you've published your research, what do you do with it? Um, so that's, those should all be really interesting um, coming up. So uh, do feel free, uh, uh, Liran, if you could also share the, uh, the link for that. Um, that would be uh, fantastic. Uh, and I'm now going to... Uh, to try and get to uh, some of some of your questions, uh, I saw there were a lot of questions coming in, so uh, so I'm not sure that we're going to be able to get to everything, but we'll be get to as many uh, questions as we possibly can. Um, and uh, you know, we or anyone can stick around. We we appreciate it. Um, so, Chris, um, questions about money, 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 money. In the end of the day, uh, what does this cost me? Uh, whether it's we're talking about the Element series or um, you know, or uh, just or just the general book. Uh, is there are there subventions? Uh, does Cambridge Finance? How does this? How does that work? So um, our standard model for books and journals is we don't expect authors to to pay anything unless um, it's going to be open access. When there would be the open access um, fee for some um, highly illustrated books using a lot of color content, we might possibly ask for subvention for that. But otherwise, no. I mean, it's the the financial risk is on, on Cambridge's side and you know we're very <laughs> grateful for the um the intellectual content that um that, that authors bring so mm -hmm. so we provide copy editing um but it's, it's the copy editing was uh won't be for a level which will turn bad English into good English but um but yeah got it um do people ever 
write an elements piece as like sort of a the basis or a, a springboard to turn it into a book later on? Is that a possibility? Or is it once you've published the elements piece, it's sort of move on to the next topic because it's already been published? Sure. So I think and that's very much the choice of the individual author. But we've tried to um, uh, structure our contract for elements to give author maximum freedom to, to do that. And one of our early thoughts was indeed that it would be a, a good way of, um, as you say, being a, a platform springboard to 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 a longer to a longer piece. And I, we're in touch with a, a number of elements authors uh, about that, but it's, it's not a requirement, and it's also not a requirement that they have to come to Cambridge. So their their contract would give them freedom to go to any other publisher for it. But um, uh, I think it's a good. It's a good way for people who haven't ever written a full length book to, um, you know, it's less intimidating. So it's, you know, it's I think it's quite good, <laughs> good training. Not that writing shorter is, is, um, is easy. I mean, it's keeping to a word count is, is, is tough. And, and um, in terms of I, there, I, I know that I think a lot of people while we were talking, were kind of checking out the elements page and you've got a list of subject areas there, which is really great. Um, Let's say I'm a scholar who has is working on research in it doesn't I, it doesn't fit into any of the categories neatly. Does that mean that there isn't any element series in that field, or does that just mean that I need to dig a little deeper and see you know how I fit squeeze mine into another one? How yeah, like I, I think I noticed I could be wrong with this. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think when I was on the page of the day, I noticed I was looking for education. I couldn't find education. So what would oh, yeah? So um, I mean, obviously, elements is a very relatively kind of young program, particularly in the context of the centuries old publishing at Cambridge. Um, so we've only been around for uh, three or four years. And um, so what we have at the moment is where we're at is we expect the, the coverage to be to be wider than it is. But I think the reality is if you're in an area, so if you're working in the field of education at the moment, we don't, um, we don't currently have a, an education element series. So it'd be difficult to see how we could accommodate that in any of the other series. But as it happens, we are talking to some people about setting up a, an education series. So, I mean, just learning about the interest um, in that is useful for us. It's good sort of market intelligence for us. Um, we might consider setting up a series, but unless there is a series um, for which your content would be a good fit, then I'm afraid we'd have, we couldn't offer publication possibility. Got it. And, and, and in terms of, um, we, we had a few, uh, you know, some discussions before the, before this evening, um, just about how, how did, you know, you're thinking of making things um, dynamic in the sense that uh, after it's published, you know, uh, it could evolve in one way or another. Um, can you just tell us a little bit more about yeah. what that would look like? Yeah, so what, one of our goals um, is very much to um, give authors the possibility to update their content, to keep it um, sort of um, up to date with the latest research and, and literature. Um, there are, that's sort of more difficult for us to do um, from a sort of technical point of view than I think we'd anticipate to begin with. But um, so we we can we update content via new editions as as we would do in kind of conventional book world. Um, they're kind of relatively kind of simpler to do, and we're just starting, even though. Uh, most of our content is only uh, 12, 18 months old. We're just starting to see one or two elements where we're doing new additions to take account of COVID or US election and that sort of thing. But, but certainly it's our longer term goal to have it as, um, uh, as a possibility, not a requirement for authors to be able to, um, you know, to make sure that their content is always as up to date and as current with the latest research as possible. Got it. And, and, and a few people have mentioned that they, they, like, they've seen similar concepts, but maybe they're not similar, uh, with other publishers with like introduction to series. Is that totally different than what Elements is trying to do? If I have, you know, if I want to cover a top, like give an intro to a topic, is that relevant for Elements or, or should you look elsewhere? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that, um, at the moment there's an awful lot of experimentation and, um, new, new, um, new series being launched by all sorts of publishers. Um, so I think um, uh, what Elements is uh, unique about Elements is it's all organized in, in series. Um, in terms of introduction, obviously introduction can mean kind of different things, but um, we see the natural level for Elements as being a, a kind of graduate and uh, researcher level rather than um, sort of a 101 um, foundation level, if that makes sense. But um, 
yeah, so it's organised in, in content at uh, at a at a level which would give um, you know, kind of advanced undergraduate graduate students a good entry point into the subject. Um, researchers are quickly getting up to speed in, in an area um, and uh, to understand you know what's really um, at the kind of the latest um, uh, research trends and, and how they relate to the wider literature. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, one more question, and then I, I, I just want to wrap up with this last question. But I want to make one point um, to those people who have stuck around, and thank you for doing so, um, which sort of, you know, relates back to what um, to what we talked about earlier, which is on the one hand, there's a risk in publishing in a new fora. On the other hand, I think that there's an opportunity as well. You know, sometimes we have a hesitation as academics to try and to publish in a place where we don't know exactly how it's going to be recognized. But I want to remind people that, you know, I don't think that, that adding... Cambridge to your name will do you will do you any harm. So I I, I think that you know it, it's it, there is a certain you know uh, taking the jump the jump into the deep um, and, and that's but you know I, I think we had the same feelings a few years ago about about open access. You know I know there were certain people who wouldn't publish in open access journals even if they had the funding because they just weren't sure where it was going to go. Now so there's no guarantees you know exactly what direction it's going to take. But for my you know um, uh, you know from from how I've gotten to know Chris and his team, I have no doubt that. That, that, that it'll, it'll be positive wherever, wherever it ends up going. Um, so to finish off, uh, I know we have a spread of, of jun more junior scholars and more senior scholars. I'm not talking about age, I'm just talking about uh, publication experience. Um, is, do, how much do you take previous uh, publication experience into account? Uh, if I don't yet have 10 publications, should I you know, say, forget it, I'll come back when I'm older? Or you know, uh, do you not look at that at all? Like how does that, how does previous experience, um, you know, well, yeah, I mean, I think um, inevitably it, it is important. I mean, it's something which we, we'll, we kind of notice whether someone's um, got a, uh, a strong publishing record or not. But we're also, particularly in our research monograph um, publishing, which is a big part of what we do and is integral to our mission as a university press, we know that we're publishing the work of a lot of um, early career scholars who would be unreasonable to expect them to have a long list of publications. We frequently get asked, do we publish revised PhDs? And the answer is yes, we do. But we generally speaking would encourage um, um, scholars to take a bit of time to really test out their arguments a bit more in the journals, get their name a bit better known. And so give them a bit of time to reflect a bit more on, on, on their research to, um, um, so that when they do come to write a book, they write a better book, a bigger book that's a bit more ambitious. Um, and, you know, I think if you're going to bring a, a book into the world, you have to have a good reason for doing so. But, you know, it's sort of, there are, there are plenty of books out there already. So, you know, kind of make sure that what you do, give it your best chance to be impactful, that it's going to be, I say, make that original and significant contribution to the literature is what we, what we look for. So, um, so yeah, kind of your publishing track record, clearly it's something we kind of notice, but we try and be as democratic as we can in our review process. Um, we publish a lot of early career scholars and just because you won the Nobel Prize doesn't necessarily mean that you no, know, <laughs> except and we have, you know, as, as I mentioned, we, um, we have actually declined work by Nobel Prize winners in the past as well. So, um, so it is a pretty democratic process and um, as, um, but we, you know, we want to work closely with early career scholars and to you know, continue working with them throughout their academic career. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that must take a bit of guts to send a rejection letter to a Nobel Prize, uh, to a Nobel <laughs> yeah. Prize winner. It wasn't, it wasn't me, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> you, got off, you got off easy then. Yeah. I got it. Brilliant, brilliant. This, is, this has been really great, Chris. Um, I really, thank you so much for your time. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, Thank you everyone for, for joining us from around the world. Uh, it's really lovely to see, you know, people from early morning to late at night joining us uh, from everywhere. Um, if you do have further questions, you know, I encourage you to check out the Cambridge website. Uh, if you have questions for me, I encourage you, you know, to be in touch. Uh, I really am trying to make myself as available as much as a resource as possible. Uh, if you want help, if you're not sure, if you have a piece that you're thinking, oh, maybe this could be interesting for, for Cambridge, but you want some extra, you know, uh, you know, guidance and review before you're ready to go there, um, feel free to reach out, share with me. Um, I'm happy to take a look uh, and try and point you in the right direction and see if, see if we might be able to help. So um, thanks again, Chris. Uh, wishing everyone a good morning, good afternoon, and good night, um, uh, wherever you are. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, and um, and thanks, for, thanks for joining us. Thanks very much. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.